worship on this third of May, the first Sunday of the month. Here we are again. Here we are still, worshiping virtually, as we will for a while yet, but there'll be more about that in a little bit. We remind you that we're going to celebrate communion this morning, so if you don't have your elements already with you, you can hit pause and go grab them and, and hit play again when you're ready to roll. We've run through the, the slides of the seniors who would have been graduating today, and so our thoughts and prayers are with all of them. They're going to be receiving their uh, prayer shawls and, and blankets from UMW uh, this coming week, and also, uh, actually, they got delivered yesterday, didn't they? I think they did. So they already have them, so I'm, I'm not spoiling any surprises. But I am happy to tell you this morning that all four applicants uh, to the scholarship fund are awarded scholarships this year. The church scholarship went to Shaley Mertens, the UMW scholarship to Aaron Schmidt, and then the UMYF scholarship was awarded both to Maddie Bonin and also to Alexis Schmidt. So congratulations to all of them. Those are the announcements that I have for the moment. So let us prepare our hearts and minds to worship together. Sisters and brothers, let us gather with glad and generous hearts. For many signs and wonders are being done among us. Let us break bread together and share our lives in common. Let us give what we can to all who have needs, so that all people, no matter who they are, may regard us with goodwill. Let us devote ourselves to our prayers and to the gospel. For in this way, God will add to our numbers every day. Let us pray. Good and gracious Lord, who sent Jesus to be the shepherd of us all, our redemption and our protection. Direct us by your presence and watch over our paths with guiding love, that we may keep our hearts fixed on you, and so follow in the paths of faith, that we may come to where you would have us, through the same Jesus Christ our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. This morning, our scripture is taken from the second chapter of the book of Acts. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and fellowship, to the breaking of bread and the prayers. Awe came upon everyone, because many wonders and signs were being done by the apostles. All who believed were together and had all things in common. They would sell their possessions and goods and distribute the proceeds to all, as any had need. Day by day, as they spent much time together in the temple, they broke bread at home and ate their food with glad and generous hearts, praising God and having the goodwill of all the people. And day by day, the Lord added to their number those who were being saved. Well, it's always interesting to talk to someone who lived through a particular event in history. Like I can talk to my mom and dad and they can recall where they were when they found out that President Kennedy had been assassinated or even on 9-11 where people were when they found out what had happened in New York and Pennsylvania and Washington DC and many years from now people will look back upon this experience and remember what it was like. Remember that time that a roll of toilet paper cost more than a barrel of oil? It's just, it's crazy and weird times but Things, things change and they strike us and, and we go through them and we remember them sometimes differently than other people do. And the same is true of, of even like a whole movement rather than just one particular event, but a, a whole movement. You think about like the American Revolution and how different that was for those folks. And you think about the Civil Rights Movement and how different it was for those folks. When I was in seminary, one of my seminary professors would share stories with us about how he marched with uh, Dr. King and the Civil Rights Movement in the 1960s, and we were always just enamored by those stories because it was so interesting that something we could only read about, but none of us had ever had ever gone through. But there's something about the momentum of a movement that's both spiritual and sometimes it's also political. These movements inspire authors and poets and artists and historians, and composers and filmmakers to try to convey what it was like to live through those times, to be a part of any particular movement. And the people who participate in those movements, the internal struggles that they might have, and how they deal with 
you know, conflicting interests and conflicting ideals and even conflicting styles of leadership, the hardship and oppression that they may have felt at the hands of whatever was going on at that particular time, but they always emerged with a deeper sense of community, of connection, of, of humanity that tended to draw them more together than it did to pull them apart. And this passage from the book of Acts this morning talks about just such a movement. In fact, the, the, whole, the entire book of Acts is just such a movement. The author of Acts, which most biblical scholars believe is the same person who wrote the Gospel of Luke, which most people believe was a fellow named Luke, but the author of Acts, whether or not it was Luke, talks about this movement, and on the one hand, it's kind of a tentative movement, but on the other hand, it sometimes feels kind of like a street festival. It's got kind of two different things going on. On the one hand, it's a little subversive, but on the other hand, it seems it was kind of carried out in a, in a public forum, so to speak. There was this new current moving within Judaism, but at the same time, there was a whole new school of thought, a whole new religion being born, a very distinctive way of believing and being. And it was referred to as the way. I remember years ago, there was a version of the Bible that was put out entitled The Way. I don't know if that's still in print or not, but that was, that was the way it was referred to. And these movements, this movement, this new denomination, this new religion, this new way of thinking, it wasn't a one-time event that just happened all of a sudden. And it wasn't really terribly tidy. It was kind of a progression that grew. It started in one place, and it grew, and it grew, and this person told somebody, and they told people, and so on, and so forth. But it was only by God's grace and the faith of the participants that this movement was able to take hold, that this movement was able to grow, and one day change the world. I mean, think about the world today that we live in and how it has been affected by Christianity and how it started with just so few people following one man. That movement changed where people lived and what they believed and how, how they lived out their faith. It changed everything about them. This passage shows a glimpse into that time of transition. There's a mention of the temple, which shows us and showed the original readers of this text that they were still considering themselves as within Judaism. They still went to the temple. They still went to the Jewish house of worship. But they were trying to figure out new ways to do things. Luke shows us in the book of Acts these shifts in faith and these shifts in practice where they were developing a new ethic, a new practice, a new way of being, a new way of being believers, a new way of being a community of faith. And the Christianity, certainly over the course of time, has changed everything about human history. How we understand our relationships with one another, how we understand our relationship with God, what it means to help other people, what it means to share a meal together. In this particular passion, that it changes from just eating a meal to breaking bread with one another. It changed a fundament, fundamental understanding of things that had been taken for granted previously. It changed, it changed paradigms. It changed models of thought. It, it, it challenged people to reconsider the way they've been going through the motions and instead think what those things might mean on a deeper level. And we can relate to that these days because the things that we once took for granted are very, very different now. We can't all just pile in the car and go to the store or go to the mall and kill a couple hours just walking around. We're told to go with purpose and to send one person to the store. Not, not take everybody, not so that there's five or six in a family in one aisle of the grocery store. The signs very specifically say send one person per family Get in, get out, get on with your life. But in this passage, even just eating together becomes spiritual. Now we're eating with our families in our own homes. If there are people who live with us, many of us are eating alone. Perhaps we took for granted the benefit and the joy of being able to break bread with one another. 
But we understand that there's more to eating than just finishing supper and putting the dishes in the dishwasher. Luke reminds us that it is a spiritual act, one that invites us to consider where Christ is in our midst, how Christ is with us even in those times that we might be alone, whenever we break bread with one another. We're invited to reconsider all of those things that have come before and consider what are they like today and what are they going to look like tomorrow. For us, this is also a time of transition, and we don't know what tomorrow is going to look like, just like these early Christians didn't know whether or not they would be able to practice their faith. They didn't know if they were ultimately going to be forced back into their previous notion of Judaism or whether it was going to be a whole, a whole new thing. But they move forward with faith and with God's grace. And so what do we make of this passage today? We're told in this passage that they were all together and they held all things in common. Well, that means different things to different people. Clearly, we know that today we're not all together. All of those ads on TV remind us that we're together, but we're apart. It's a new way of being together virtually. It's a new way of being together in thoughts and minds and over the phone and via Skype and, and Duo and FaceTime and Zoom meetings. It's a new way of being. Now, whether it's going to stay this way forever or not, I certainly don't know. God is the only one who knows how things are going to completely transition or change after all of this is over, if it is ever over at all. But it was their discernment that led them forward. The disciples relied upon the movement of the Holy Spirit to give them the guidance that they needed in order to continue to move forward. And that's what we are called to do as well. So many ads on TV talk about these uncertain times and these challenging times and these difficult times. And, and those are true. But they also can be hopeful times. They also can be times of discernment and excitement, wondering what new thing will result from all of this. What new ways will God reach out and touch our lives? What new ways will we be able to minister to other people? You know, a year ago, I would never have dreamed that every, every week I'd be preaching into a camera, hoping that somebody on the other end might get something out of it. This is not what I was prepared for in seminary. You know, the, the preaching instructors would tell us this, that, and the other. Never once did they ever mention anything about live streaming or pre-recorded sermons or about having to preach to an empty sanctuary. But here we are. We do what we can with what we have to work with, and we let God take care of the rest. And we seek that same discernment, not knowing exactly how to go forward. Now, the big question this week has been whether to meet or not to meet in person. Last Friday, the governor of Nebraska said that houses of worship could start meeting in person again with groups of 50 or less, still maintaining social distancing principles, meaning six feet between, between people. And he specifically said that one family could sit together in a pew, but then the next people would have to be at least six feet away. So curiosity got the better of me. And I came here into the sanctuary and I measured how far apart our pews are. And it turns out that if someone is sitting in the front pew, then you would have to leave two empty pews before the next person could sit. And so this morning I went through and counted, that would allow us to use 15 pews in our sanctuary. And I know that some families have many people, and some families come as a family of one. And so I know there's going to be different, but then I thought, well, who's going to enforce this? Because... You and I both know that there's going to be people who obey these rules, and there will be people who think they're nonsense, who won't obey those rules. I certainly don't want to be the bouncer. I don't want to have to be the enforcer. And I thought, well, who's going to stand at the door and tell people, I'm sorry, we have too many already for worship, you have to go home. I don't want to be that person. Our bishop, uh, Reuben Sines, Bishop of the Great Plains area of the United Methodist Church, which includes our conference of Nebraska and Kansas, sent a letter out uh, to all the clergy earlier this week talking about the challenges that we are facing. And I want to share with you a portion of that letter. 
Um, he wrote that for now, churches with an average worship attendance of more than 50 should continue to hold online worship services and record from home or the sanctuary with a small group of people. There will come a time when all gathering size restrictions are lifted. However, we must anticipate that our lives and timelines will be shaped for at least the next year by the behavior of COVID-19. If at any time within a recovery stage, COVID-19 cases significantly rise, a reversal to the previous step may be necessary. The directed health measures that we take are meant to ensure the safety of our congregations, especially our older adults and people of any age who have serious underlying medical conditions who might be at higher risk. I do not want to increase fear, but gathering in closed quarters, singing, our contact rituals, and decreased ventilation in our gathering spaces create a ripe environment for viral transmission. I strongly urge you to err on the side of caution. To gather in person or not for worship at this time is not a matter of faith versus faithlessness or about some conspiracy to suppress Christianity. This is about honoring and doing our part individually and collectively to protect God's sacred gift of life, especially for the most vulnerable in our communities and our world. And so our administrative council, church council, met this week, virtually, via Zoom, to talk about whether or not we felt we should open up for worship again, in-person worship. And we decided that it is not yet time. And there are people who will think that that is complete nonsense. They think, well, I don't have it, I'm not going to get it, I'm not afraid of it. And that's, that's fine if people aren't afraid of getting it, but we have to consider that some of us may already be carrying this and sharing it, spreading it to other people, and putting them at risk. It's not about whether or not I think I'm safe, it's a matter of keeping other people safe as well. And so we decided that for the month of May, we will continue to meet online only. We're not going to get together for in-person worship for the month of May. The Administrative Council will meet in a few weeks and decide what we're going to do for June and the subsequent months. But for right now, we're going to keep on doing what we have been doing for these past several weeks, and that is joining together virtually. And I just would remind us of the disciples in their uncertain time, not knowing what to do or how to do it. They and we should rely upon the movement of the Holy Spirit for discernment, for prayer, for guidance, for strength, that God will show us what it is that we should be doing. None of us have ever been through this before. But God will see us through. We don't know what it's going to look like on the other side, it may be very, very different. Perhaps it won't be as different as we think it's going to be. We can speculate until we're blue in the face, but none of us knows. What we do know is that we can take steps to try to keep everyone as healthy and safe as they can be. And that's what we are choosing to do at the Geneva United Methodist Church. We are not the first ones to go through uncertain times, and I can guarantee you we will not be the last ones to go through uncertain times. But as uncertain as they feel, let us be mindful that we do not go through them alone. Whether we have one in our home, or six, or seven, whether we share a meal regularly with other people, or whether we eat by ourselves, God is with us whenever and wherever we are. And until we can come together again, in person, in this space for worship, we must be mindful that God is still with us, that God is guiding us, that God loves us, and there's nothing we can do to change that. So as we move forward, let us continue to lean on God, to lean on one another as we are able to do so. And let us also remember to reach out to one another and offer help and care whenever and wherever we can. Amen. Now let us prepare our hearts and our minds for a time of communion together. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them up to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give our thanks and praise. It is right and a good and joyful thing, always and everywhere, to give thanks to you, Almighty God, creator of heaven and earth. You formed us in your image and breathed into us the breath of life. 
when we turned away and our love failed, your love remained steadfast. You delivered us from captivity, made covenant to be our sovereign God, brought us to a land flowing with milk and honey, and set before us the way of life. And so, with your people on earth, and all the company of heaven, we praise your name and join their unending hymn. Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Holy are you and blessed is your Son, Jesus Christ. By the baptism of his suffering, death, and resurrection, you gave birth to your church, delivered us from slavery to sin and death, and made with us a new covenant by water and the Spirit. By your great mercy, we have been born anew to a living hope through the resurrection of your Son from the dead and to an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled, and unfading. Once we were no people, but now we are your people, declaring your wonderful deeds in Christ, who called us out of darkness and into his marvelous light. When the Lord Jesus ascended, he promised to be with us always in the power of your word and Holy Spirit. On the night in which he gave himself up for us, he took bread. He gave thanks to you, broke the bread, gave it to his disciples and said, Take, eat, this is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. When the supper was over, he took the cup, gave thanks to you, gave it to his disciples and said, Drink from this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. On the day you raised him from the dead, he was recognized by his disciples in the breaking of the bread, and in the power of your Holy Spirit, your church has continued in the breaking of the bread and the sharing of the cup. And so, in remembrance of these your mighty acts in Jesus Christ, we offer ourselves in praise and thanksgiving as a holy and living sacrifice in union with Christ's offering for us as we proclaim the mystery of faith. Christ, Christ has died. died. Christ is risen, Christ will come again. Pour out your Holy Spirit on everybody gathered around this day. Pour out your Spirit on all these gifts of bread and wine. Make them be for us the body and blood of Christ, that we may be for the world the body of Christ, redeemed by His blood. By your Spirit, make us one with Christ, one with each other, and one in ministry to all the world, until Christ comes in final victory, and we feast at His heavenly banquet. Through your Son, Jesus Christ, with the Holy Spirit in your Holy Church, all honor and glory is yours, Almighty God, now and forever. Amen. And now, with the confidence of the children of God, let us pray together our Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. shed for you and for me for the forgiveness of sin. We invite you to receive the elements in your homes wherever you are at this time. Shall go on. 
time of prayer, let us continue to pray for Harper Taylor and the family of Bill Harris and all that is unfolding in our world. So let us pray. Joyful and giving, Lord, we continue this path of resurrection. We're walking with you on the journey to Pentecost. And with all that is unfolding in our world, it can be really easy to forget the celebration of Easter Day. And yet we're reminded that we are an Easter people. We are your Easter people always and forever. So in this season of Easter, may we daily live the resurrection in our spirits. May we share the joy with all around us. And those times when joy seems hard to find, remind us, O oh God, that your plan for each of us and all of us in Christ's community is so much bigger than our own desires, our own hurts, our own fears, our own plans. Keep us connected to your energy of love so that we cannot help but share it with the world. God, you have laid out your intentions for us, you are beloved people. You call us to share one another's burdens, sharing our gifts and all of our treasures with one another. Forgive us when we hoard what we have. Forgive us when we cling to possessions and call them ours. Help us to be signs of your grace and your mercy for one another. And when we cling to our things as our security, give us hearts that are ready to share. And when our life together feels burdensome, renew our excitement and serving one another. Help us to marvel at the power of the Spirit which makes our transformation possible. We know we can be changed this day, O oh God, through Jesus Christ. And so we pray for those who make decisions. We pray for those who are determined to find a way through this craziness, for those on the cusp of discovering a cure. Help us to have listening hearts, a loving spirit. And Lord, Help us always to be kind. We may not agree with decisions, but we can choose to be kind, and we can choose to be understanding through it all. And so, Lord, as we await the day of the Holy Spirit, may you keep us alive in your hope and show us how to truly be your church in our acceptance, our care, and our love of others in this life. For we ask all this and more in the name of the risen one, our God, now and forever. Amen. As we close this time of worship today, I invite you to consider what God is calling you to do in this uncertain time. What kind of discernment can you lean on wherever you are. Spend more time in prayer. Spend more time checking on others. Doing what we can with what we have to work with, knowing that God will take care of the rest. Be well, be safe, and be blessed.